Uh, yeah, hey, I'm Martin Beasy. Uh, I work for the Ethereum Foundation. I do research. Uh, I'm working on doing a lot with the, the Ethereum virtual machine right now. Um, I'm wandering on GitHub. Uh, today I'm going to talk about like really a dag of ideas uh, because they're not ordered in any, they're partially ordered, okay? <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, what would it look like to have an, employer, an interplanetary operating system? We have, you know, file systems, oh, yeah. why not? Um, and this also uh, intersects a lot with the work I'm doing and yeah, I think it's really cool. So let's start with, um, here's where we're Here's where we're at today. Like we can, you know, mount a IPFS hash. Um, and we can uh, at the root directory, and we get you can CD into any hash, and then below that are all the files, and that's pretty cool. Um, so, next step is obviously running binaries from a mounted, uh, uh, you know, folder. So I should be able like to add my uh, bin directory and you know, CD into uh, the hash and run a program. Now, this doesn't quite work right now. Uh, I think that's maybe due to the limitations of fuse, but you can't actually make a program executable, but you know, that I'm sure it's just a, a detail. So, the next thing we'd like to be able to do is write files. Uh, we can't do this yet, as far as I know. Maybe, I don't know if y'all figured it out, but um, writing's a little bit more complicated. So, it'd be, but, it's pretty important for operating systems to be able to uh, write files. Um, but it doesn't quite fit into the way that it, uh, IPFS currently mounts files. Right? So you mount the root directory and you have the hashes directory and then all the other files. Um, so you don't, if you change uh, a file in one of the directory, obviously you're generating a new root hash. So uh, where is that hash? So there has to be a slightly different topology. Um, so maybe one way to do it would be to mount individual uh, files or individual root hashes. So for example, maybe I could mount a root hash directly to my music folder and that would contain like all my music. And then I could CD into it, download some music, uh, and, but we still, we have a new hash there. We have a new root hash since we changed it. So we need, you know, some utilities. Um, Unix and Linux has, you know, print work directory. This is actually most of the time implemented in your shell. It's not implemented as a uh, user space program necessarily, but it's always built off, you know, POSIX C functions, uh, get current working directory or get present directory. So ideally we'd have maybe something like print working hash, uh, print working directory hash, you know, to get the current root hash. Uh, and there needs to be some sort of something equivalent to a POSIX C function where we can build user space um, programs to do this. Now, it doesn't have to be a POSIX use uh, function. It could be um, RPC calls or something, but we need some layer where we can be, build user space utils like that, I think. Um, and we should also be able to do the same with IPNS. So, like, if I mount an IPNS directory, this is, this is, I think, really cool. Like, if I, uh, a public, if I have just a public key, I can mount it and get all updates. So I can, like, um, I can mount Mavis's music file to my music directory and uh, get all the new um, music, well, all the new music files he puts in there. But if I have the private key, that should mount as not only readable, but writable. And then whenever I write to that directory or change it, the new uh, state root gets published. So, and then we should be able to have like fine-grained controls over sharing subgraphs. Like I should be able to uh, CD in, uh, CD into my music uh, folder, uh, create a new IPNS link to it. So that creates a new, uh, a new, um, private public key pair, and I can give that hash out to someone. And I should be able to do it again. So I create one, I should be able to create another one. I should be able to list out the different links I have to a particular folder. And uh, lastly, I should be able to revoke them and remove those links. Uh, and this, this enables me to have fine-tuned control over 
to uh, who has read permissions to what folders. Uh, and I think of it in terms of capabilities. I don't know if anyone's familiar with capability systems, but um, right, cool. Um, one person, <laughs> two, three. Oh, that's pretty good. Um, um, but a, uh, a IPNS link is a read capability, uh, and after you revoke it, obviously the person still has can always read the last hash that was published to it, uh, but they won't get any further updates. Um, so yeah, multiple IPNS um, identities would be like super awesome, and being able to bind them to folders. So one thing would be cool would be like have um, link all my friends' music together in a local folder. You know, like I link this IPNS hash to my friend slash Brad. I could have all my friends' music in a folder. I don't know. I like music, so um, I think it's cool. Um, and the operating system, so IPFS doesn't traverse through IPNS links because that's mutable, but the uh, OS system layer should be able to traverse through um, uh, IPFS links and IPNS links and any other kind of links that we throw at it, um, not just Merkle links. Um, we also need to be able to have, yeah, so this gets into the point, we need flexible link handlers. So. Let's say we have a scenario where the music uh, folder is shared um, on IPFS, but we have a subfolder that we don't want to share. So we need a way to accommodate that. So maybe what gets hashed into the music folder is uh, just some symbolic reference to this thing here, but not the Merkle link. Um, so as I said, this is an unordered, uh, speech, it's a DAG, <laughs> um, so I'm going to switch gears. Uh, I'm doing a lot of work with WebAssembly right now, um, and I want to talk about one second. Uh, WebAssembly is a new portable size and load time efficient binary format that aims to execute at native speed by taking advantage of common hardware capabilities across a wide range of platforms. I think it's really awesome. Uh, the key takeaways are fast, efficient, uh, secure, Sandboxed has tool chain co cap uh, compatibility. It means it works with uh, LLVM. So anything you can compile with LLVM, you should be able to run in a WebAssembly virtual machine. So out of the box, you know, C, C++, Rust, uh, all those things work. And it's extensible. It's easy to uh, plug it into other systems. It's easy to embed. Um, and it has the combined powers of the web. Uh, so yeah, it's being standardized by Google, uh, Microsoft, Mozilla, Apple. So that's, yeah, all the big players. Um, in the history of it, it came out of something that was written in 2012 called the Extensible Web Manifesto. And the problem that the web had was instilled some, some sense is whenever it adds a new API that extends the surface area uh, that needs to be secure. So by instead of having a large uh, surface area, if you build small primitives, then you can build your new features in these uh, low-level primitives. So yeah, another thing would uh, reduce the regrowth of complexity and therefore bugs in implementations uh, and allow browsers and vendors uh, iterate on libraries before uh, publishing high-level APIs, right? Um, and in Ethereum, uh, all these things are also applicable to blockchains, actually even more so, right? So like what we face today is uh, we have uh, a really large trusted computer base. We have a virtual machine, we have all these pre-compiles, and we have like state rules. And state rules are like how we update the state, like um, moving balances from one count to another. And I would say it's even getting worse because we have more pre-compiles coming down the line, and every time we add a pre-compile, we have extend, uh, expanded uh, trusted computing base. Uh, and it's super, super, important in a blockchain that like 
every implementation implements it correctly. If you don't, you break consensus. So it's even more important than in the browser environment. So uh, a big trusted computing base are, is really, really bad for symmetric computation platforms. And that uh, symmetric computation is the basis for, as far as I know, all blockchain-based consensus. So um, instead of building things out, we should start with a very small trusted computing base and have a VM bedrock and then build everything in it. And I think we should think about the state rules more in terms of a kernel, since ultimately they deal with interprocess communication between contracts. It really is a kernel. And then like all the um, pre-compiled should just be user space per, uh, contracts like any other in, unprivileged contract. Um, and this is, I'm experimenting with some of these ideas in eWASM kernel uh, today and part of the eWASM project. Um, so now to jump back. We have uh, an IPPLD as Juan talked about earlier translators, and I was super excited when he, he said that the, they were thinking about using Wasm, because <laughs> that's what I'm talking about too. <laughs> um, so a translator, so uh, there's a little bit of a historical context to uh, translators, and I think, or, uh, and I think I, IPLD matches closely to what translators are. Um, translators in uh, Plan 9 in Herd, I don't know if anyone knows what, anyone know what Plan 9 and Herd are, right? Okay, there's a few, yay. Um, so there are operating systems. Uh, Plan 9 was developed as a sort of, to be the successor to Linux or Unix. And it didn't really take off ground for a number of reasons. One of them was licensing. And Herd is also along the same lines. Um, it's been, it's an operating system that uh, Richard Stolman has been developing since like forever. So um, anyways, a translator is a, sim is a pr normal program that acts as an object server and participates in Herd's uh, distributed file system. Um, and basically what it does is takes in some data, it goes to the translator, and exports a common file system interface. And something like IPFS, or I, IPLD, you take in some data, you put, th uh, put it through a resolver, but our translator here, and you come out with a common vertex. So um, another way to put it is, this is also copied out of Herd's manual. Uh, a translator just translates from one re representation of data structure into another representation. So pretty straightforward. Um, so yeah, if you wrote IPLD, Translators in WASM, you don't have to uh, implement one translator for all implementations. Translators themselves can be resolved by IPFS, which means less dependence on implementations and more modularity overall, which is great stuff. And you could implement it, these things could be implemented in uh, user space, ideally, if there was just a common, you know, API. So, um, one, one thing we do with translators that Kamavis has been working on, it's super cool, and also uh, uh, why are you sleeping with other blockchains, is uh, importing the blockchain into IPFS. So like, here's, this isn't actually the structure of what Ethereum looks like totally. I left out a lot of stuff, but um, this is an example of uh, what it looked like. So you have block at the top level and the counts, and, uh, you have all your different account um, addresses, and then inside account, you have a nonce, a balance, and storage. And inside storage, you have all your different keys. Um, so uh, we have these. We have this file structure now. Uh, what if Ethereum contracts were just programs in a general purpose uh, OS backed by a content-addressable file system? That's sort of a mouthful, but like that would be pretty cool, I think. Um, so what do we want from use space? User space. Well, we we want to. We know we need to run symmetric computations. So I'm starting from Ethereum, trying to work backwards from what we want. We, we have Ethereum. We have a content addressable file system. So let, let's try to work backwards. Um, we we want 
we know we need some metric computation, it needs to be deterministic by default, it needs to be sandboxed. Right? Uh, and we want to, I would like, I think it's pretty important that we can reuse legacy programs written in C and C++. Uh, and it also needs to be like fairly simple and well specified. And these are, several of these things are covered by default by what WASM does. Um, but we need, a, we need a communication layer still. Uh, we can't just use Linux straight because it's very complicated. There's lots of details we don't care about at this layer. Uh, it's not completely deterministic. It's not sandbox by default, though there's some interesting work going on with subgraph and cubes OS uh, at, with regards to sandboxing. <clears throat> um, okay, so jumping a, a little bit again, and we're gonna come back. It will make sense. Actor model. Actor model is really cool. Uh, actors are these little programs that run, and they get messages in their mailbox, and when they get the messages in the mailbox, they respond, and process the message, and they can spin up the other actors, and they can send uh, messages to other actors uh, via channels. Right? Um, so I think that each contract or program is an actor or server running in a microkernel framework. Right? Uh, and the reason the actor model is really nice in this environment is because uh, each actor is a natural split, uh, spot to build the sandbox around. Um, so, uh, really quick, uh, biographs. This is sort of my bedrock that I think of everything in. Uh, so, actors and uh, the channels they communicate through would be the hypergraph on the left, which is a link graph, and um, the Merkle Dag structure is a place graph represented by this forest here. So um, it's not really important that you need to know this, but like there's a solid mathematical framework underlining this. And I think it's good to have sort of a bedrock reality or a bedrock model reality is so that you, in you, which you can use to describe higher level features. Uh, so here, yeah, the forest or place graph is the Merkle DAG, and the hypergraph is the communication lines between programs. Um, so for example, we saw earlier that the big graph of Ethereum mapped into a folder or uh, uh, DAG structure. Um, here's it sort of graphed in a hypergraph. So uh, blocks at top, and then you know all your accounts, and then you have one account here, and maybe your two X's. And the, but let's say like the account code wants to figure out the current block hash or the block number, or block difficulty. It may want to talk directly to the block, so it may open a channel to the block. So that's uh, the DAG structure and the actor channel in, in one graph. Um, microkernels. Microkernels have a long history. There's lots of them out there. But uh, so what they are, if you're not familiar with them, it's just a very minimal amount of software needed to provide a, uh, or to implement an operating system. Um, so the microkernel, and that we're working on or thinking about is just providing interprocess communication between uh, our actors, which are Ethereum contracts. <coughs> so here's where we are today. We have a, like all these things squished together into one protocol, one software stack, consensus, contract, IPC, networking. It's sort of big ball of mud, scary. Uh, here's where I think we should be moving. Um, so. At the bottom, we have a file system. Networking could be provided by IPFS and the BTP. Uh, on top of that, we have a microkernel, which our programs and contracts exist in. And from that, we can build consensus protocols, such as Ethereum. <coughs> and uh, you know, as the ecosystem grows and progresses, this, this is not fixed. We can move, move more and more into the microkernel layers, and more and more can just become 
uh, like user space programs. Um, so yeah, modularity is really important. Um, Conway's law. An organization with design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Uh, basically, if you hire seven teams to design a compiler, you're going to come up with a compiler with seven different modules or seven different steps. So it's, um, and a system, systems have to, I think, be modular for them to evolve because that's how like humans program and work together. Uh, so I think it's really, really important to break things off into modules. <coughs> so vertices. Uh, yeah, vertices are programs. Um, uh, you know, uh, Linux has the saying, um, everything is a file. Uh, and our IPOS, everything is a vertex, okay? Um, and to borrow from plan nine again, you know, uh, they just have servers that uh, the, uh, just a user space program can implement a file server. And one possibility to use these servers for is to uh, synthesize vertices or files on demand and perhaps based on the information on the data structure inside the kernel itself. So you have maybe a DAG, and you would have a agent, uh, uh, our actor, and it could synthesize uh, a further DAG depending on its position in the tree, etc. So it'd be nice to do stuff like that. Um, everything's a file. So I want to make a small note that vertexes are a little bit different than files because a vertex has a value and it has edges. Uh, and um, if we say a vertex is also a program, that value is code, those edges are ports. Uh, oh, shoot. So um, in actor terminology, ports are what actors uh, use to talk to other actors through. So we need a system API. Um, and it should be super simple. It needs to be easy to specify. Like Everything needs to have a very small um, trusted computing base here. Uh, and there's only really two things we need to do. We need to interact with the ports, send messages and whatnot. So set and get ports, send messages, whatnot. And we need to store and retrieve values from the file system, which is the Merkle DAG here. So um, also, so I'm sorry, this is uh, sort of what I'm playing with also with eBosm kernel. Seeing how small of a uh, API we can get it down to. Uh, and we need uh, the core of it's really into process communication. So, Channels are lines of communication. Ports are the internal name for that channel for each program has. Uh, ports can be duplex, read-only, write-only. Um, ports are cap capabilities. Uh, well, they actually have two capabilities, a read capability and write capability. Uh, those capabilities are del delegatable, so you can send them to another actor, so which means you can send ports around, which is pretty cool. So that's actually how, back in my early example where the uh, contract talks to the block, uh, to establish that, actually you'd have to send a, a read capability down through the uh, Merkle DAG hierarchy till it gets to the actor. Um, and so also, by the way, uh, a Merkle link is read-only capability. Um, if you want to know more about capabilities, you can see capillor.com and erights.org. So messages here uh, are, we, we need atomic messages and non-atomic messages. Uh, unfortunately, we have to support atomic messages right now. Uh, non-atomic messages, Ethereum doesn't have any notion of non-atomic notions at the moment. Um, but it, it will inevitably rise if we ever have sharding, when we have sharding. Uh, <laughs> Um, 
or it, it's needed for any type of scalability, really. Uh, messages are unforgeable. They have a from and a to uh, that's set by the operating system, and they have an immutable payload. So that's what I'm using for messages right now. Super simple. Um, and where do I think that this is all going? Is like we're uh, you, you, you've all seen the moral law graphs, right? <coughs> Where um, computation is like doubling, or not computation, speed. And we all know Moore's law is sort of like ended, but we we still see you know this exponential growth uh, in technology, and we still see a really good uh, growth of um, computing power uh, per watts, right? So it's, we're doing more computing power for less energy. And, and I think the net result of this is going to be that we push our computation out to the, the edges. Right? Instead of having it in big data centers, we're going to have, well, the Internet of Things. But more and more and more, uh, we'll just see computation happening all around us. Uh, this is called ubiquitous systems. Well, it, it was called ubiquitous systems. Now it's called Internet of Things, I guess, or something like that. Um, so Robin Miller would talk about this in like the 90s. He said, such a system or its component agents will be self-aware, possess beliefs about their environment, possess goals, enter into and achieve goals, and be able to adapt and to change circumstances without human intervention. Um, so computations are made to appear anywhere, and it, at any time and everywhere. So, you know, they're omnipresent. Uh, we're pushing computation to the edges. Uh, and I think the, the way that we're going to interface with these ubiquitous systems is through a homogeneous operating system, not necessarily a singleton, right? Uh, a, a content addressable file system really lays the groundwork for that. Because you don't need a central server, you can have a lot of edge nodes uh, to be able to retrieve your data, right? Uh, and from that, you can build, yeah, an operating system. So um, I think this will look a lot like my web browser with a lot of tabs open. Web browsers actually do quite a bit of this, right? Uh, they they have sandbox processes. They have inter-process communications. Web workers are agents. They're model after the agent model. Um, so, or sorry, actor model. Um, and the web is, you know, uh, it's mobile code. Uh, so I think I think there's a nexus between where web connection, web technology is taking us, and decentralized technology is taking us. And I think it's really important to w work along with web technology and the huge, massive web community that we have. So um, how to get there? P be practical over perfect. Like, you can stare at this, there's a lot of theory, right? You can stare at this theory in all day long, uh, but for me, I think, and for a lot of people, just like writing stuff, figuring out what happens in the real world, and, and then feeding back and looking at the theory and moving forwards uh, is the best way to go. So don't worry about being perfect. Just try to be practical. And embrace iteration. Everything is a prototype. Like, don't ca get caught up in the building the big final shiny thing. It's just one iteration. Keep it modu uh, modular and follow the Unix philosophy. Right? Um, really quick note, Plan 9 was awesome. Um, but Linux really got one thing right, modularity. And so. Plan 9 had all these cool things about it. But it turns out what really matters is modularity. Uh, and Linux was the first one to, to get that modularity down. And that's, I think, one reason like, uh, nothing has been able to beat it. Lastly, be your own core devs. Like, write your own code. <laughs> if you see a need, uh, it's your job to fix it. <laughs> so yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs>